Thanks for tuning in to Look at My JPEG, the podcast that discusses NFT, DeFi, and NFT financialization. This is your host, Xerox Jose, the founder of NFT Perp. The reason why I want to do this podcast is because there's just not enough people talking about NFT financializations. In this podcast, you can expect us to invite guests that are builders, founders, even investors that are deep in the NFT financialization space. We'll discuss their story, what they're building, and how you can get involved. So, thanks for tuning in. Hey, how's it going? Hello, GM. Welcome to the show. GM, GM. Uh, all right. Great to be here. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Um, anyone else from your team will be joining? Uh, yeah, we got uh, Alice here as well. I think she's already a listener on the Fungify account. All right. Um, all right. Well, hopefully we get a little bit of better turnout uh, than it is right now. But usually these episodes are recorded and uploaded to our Spotify. So, um, oh, good. Let's jump into it. Um, before we start diving into the details of Fungify, Fungify uh, why don't you give us a quick intro of yourselves? How did you get into crypto? What was your first NFT purchase? And then I'd love to ask you, ask you some questions about Fungify. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I got into crypto around uh, 2017, uh, but had been hearing about it uh, much earlier than that. I had friends into it from about 2012 or so. That, that was super interesting, um, but you know, couldn't really do much with it except uh, invest in it. Saw Ethereum, you know, when it came out in its white paper. I thought that was amazing. Uh, 2017, uh, I actually uh, started building in the space. Um, doing projects, getting involved with DeFi. Uh, later on, um, I saw NFTs. I thought they were pretty cool. I, I kind of faded them back in the day of Crypto Kitties and never bought an OG Punk. Um, <clears throat> started getting more, got got into punks maybe in March twenty one. Um, after I read the uh, Fat Crypto Punk thesis, and then kind of more and more uh, started seeing NFTs pop up um, maybe around the time of loot. Um, That's when like kind of like my DeFi social graph kind of collided with uh, the NFT space and I started getting more and more interested in it. Started trying to figure out, you know, how we could how we could solve the uh, liquidity problem, how we could, um, you know, get all this kind of idle capital and NFTs moving around. Um, And uh, yeah, met a Met some uh, other people that were working on the same problem um, around the Beat Style community, um, and we started talking. And next thing you know, uh, Fungify was born. So when did Fungify? When did the idea of Fungify uh, start? And what was sort of the the origin story of it? Yeah, I'll, I'll let I'll let Alice uh, tell this one. Yeah, sure. Like I think as Mob was uh, stating, we're working with a few DAOs uh, looking at uh, actually uh, one of the problems we were trying to address was how to get on-chain uh, or data on-chain for NFTs. And then as we're exploring some solutions around that, uh, you know, we started looking at the bigger problem, which was the problem of liquidity within the space. And at that time, I think NFTX has just launched. NFT5 was coming online. Uh, and so there was these sort of first uh, ideas around NFT Fi uh, popping off, and uh, you know that's that's where we started looking at. Okay, well, you know, all this value that's contained within that top top like one percent of uh, NFTs in terms of NFT collections, you know, that's uh, you know how do we how do we unlock liquidity for them, and how do we consolidate liquidity for them? Um, that's really where the the core idea started uh, mm. and then we started jamming and figuring out how to look at basically NFTX. What if you could consolidate that into one giant vault? What would that look like? Right. And then you need some sort of pricing Oracle for NFTs coming in, going out. Uh, that's creates a type of index. 
well, what if you could start borrowing against that index and earning yield for the holders, et cetera, et cetera. I think we've told the story in a few other places too, but uh, that, that was the gist of it. Yeah. Okay. So for those that are listening, maybe coming across Fungify for the first time, um, uh, how would you explain what Fungify is on a high level? So I think the first thing I would tell people is that Fung Fungify is a blue chip NFT index. So if you want exposure uh, to the general NFT market, but maybe you don't have, you know, $10,000, $30,000, $50,000 to spend on an NFT, uh, you can just buy uh, the Fungify NFT index and you can get exposure. Um, and it's a very cheap and efficient way of getting exposure. You're not, you're also not having to pay all kinds of uh, extra fees. It's just the swap fees uh, when you purchase the token on Uniswap. Uh, really. Um, and then second of all, I would say it's also a lending protocol and it's the best way to borrow against your NFTs if you don't want to get liquidated, if you're afraid of getting liquidated. Um, and the reason for that being uh, when you borrow um, against the index, uh, your your um, the unit of account that you're borrowing against is very highly correlated with the NFT market because it's an index of blue chip NFTs. So as whereas other platforms might have you borrowing ETH or USDC or something like that, those are quite volatile against your NFT. And so you have a higher risk of liquidation. So um, we're able to kind of minimize the risk of liquidation around your NFT um, and let you um, kind of shunt that risk to the part where you're getting uh, ETH or USDC um, against your index. Um, so yeah, it's an index first and foremost, but it's also a lending protocol for a specific kind of person for collectors who really like their NFT. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, when I was reading through the documents of Fungify, and I first came across Fungify months ago, and I met you guys um, in person, some of your team members in the Meta Street NFT Finance. What was it called? Meta Meta Forum. I think that's what it was uh yeah yeah it was, it's actually just uh, i think this was late last year in london yeah um basically all of nft5 was there uh you know the, the 50 of us or whoever was building in the space that's the right yeah it's gone a lot since then uh and it's really good to see that this this space and the builders uh you know grow along the way um and yeah like when i first read the documents i thought it was a very innovative protocol that you were doing things that um, we haven't really seen before uh, in NFT finance space. Um, and NFT X uh, definitely comes to mind as I was going through your documents. You have the, 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 the notion of depositing NFT, minting a bunch of tokens out of it. Um, but the difference is you guys are minting this um, sort of a, a currency, uh, if you will, that's, that's backed by NFTs. Um, in a way, it reminds me of like MakerDAO a little bit. It also reminded me of um, JPEG a little bit, right? Because it's a peer-to-peer uh, protocol type of lending and borrowing, and where they're issuing PE as opposed to NFT tokens. Yeah, I think I think that's a pretty. I think that I think those are um, basically the examples um, or analogies that we try to draw as well. Um, like, yeah, it's like, okay, if NFTX is like all condensed into a single vault and you use the, like a real price Oracle instead of just Uniswap, but like, yeah, the maker DAO comparison is very strong. Um, I, I think, you know, like clearly JPEG also, um, is using like a maker model as well, but the, the key, the key difference between, you know, what we see as like us and JPEG is like JPEG is providing you a stable coin backed by monkey JPEGs. And we're providing you just a coin that tracks the monkey JPEGs. <laughs> so I, I think, <laughs> I think, I think um, you know, like a question we had internally was like, hmm, do people really want a stable coin backed by monkey pictures? And, you know, I, I could definitely think of like, you know, better, better collateral for like a stable coin per se. Um, like usually you might want to, have more conservative collateral for that. Um, but yeah, we like the MakerDAO thing um, because 
people are going to be buying this NFT token for its utility as like exposure to an index, that kind of um, drives like, you know, we call it like maybe the maker DAO effect, but like there's a monetary premium on the token, like the index. Um, and so that allows there essentially that means that a lot of people that are like, if you're holding the token, you're a lender, but you might not actually be like psychologically invested in being a lender yourself. You're not thinking like, oh, I'm getting into this to be a lender. You're thinking I'm getting into this because I want the exposure and the utility that it provides. And it's and it's a similar case with Dai because you know when you want to get a loan in MakerDAO, you need to you put your ETH in the vault and then you need to sell your Dai to someone. And so essentially, whoever you sell your Dai to is a lender, but they might not think of themselves as a lender. They just think, hey, I'm just trying to get exposure to this volatility or, or lack of volatility. Um, and, you know, in the early, and, you know, this, this is like deep DeFi history, but in the very early days of, of uh, DAI, they didn't even have a DSR. They didn't even like pay um, people interest for holding DAI, even though that they're, even though they're lenders mm. and it still kept pegged. And the reason was it was able to meet the demand for borrowing just through the pure utility of people wanting to hold the stable coin. Um, and so basically that means you're, you're able to offer better, more competitive rates because you have all this lending liquidity that's essentially rate insensitive because you're offering them some kind of alternative utility in the form of how, uh, uh, the, the volatility and the exposure that that token is giving them. Yeah, yeah. And then like the, the, the addition of, Stablecoin protocols like Curve definitely had a pretty good addition to its in the maintenance of the, of its peg as well. It's almost like it got added to this giant ecosystem with other um, other sort of stablecoin protocols and, and assets. It got all mixed in there and it sort of allow it to to grow a little bit bigger, which is kind of what we've seen with JPEG as well. They have a a Curve pool with their PE. Um, so that that itself is interesting. Uh, okay, so appreciate you kind of giving your thoughts on that. Um, now let's break down Fungify because I think it's incredibly innovative and to it's it's a well balanced system from from what we've seen uh, on documentations and you guys are on testnet now. Um, if you were to break down how Fungify works on and from an architecture standpoint, how would you go about it? Um, okay, from from an architecture standpoint, um, what, what what do you mean by that exactly? Like, are you, you are you asking about how the smart contracts talk to each other, or are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, just like give us an uh, like uh, an explainer, like what makes Fungify? Like, who, who are the? Who, who, how does the protocol um, have liquidity? How does uh, sellers and, and borrowers come in and, and you know, borrow okay. liquidity. What does that go to and all that stuff? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like some of the user flows. Sure. So I guess I'd start out. Um, a big question we get asked is like, hey, um, how, does, how does the protocol kind of get initial liquidity, um, the initial bo bootstrapping? All that. So I think starting at like t equals zero here. Uh, the first thing that we're doing is we're going to be having an event called the Great Fill. There's going to be um, you know some token incentives so that people get a bonus and they deposit uh, their JPEGs. Um, and then there's there's also within the index there's incentives to make sure that it's balanced. It's uh, market cap weighted. So. Essentially, that means there's, there's going to be, you know, one, like, you know, a, an equal amount of each of the blue chip NFTs in there. You know, if, if there was one of each, if, you know, if people just deposited one of each, it'd be like one punk, one doodle, one ape, et cetera, that makes it market cap weighted. So first, the index gets filled up. All right. Next thing. W Say somebody the NFTs, wants sorry to, break, to, sorry to uh cut you off uh which nfts are considered blue chip what goes into the index yeah so um essentially 
the, what what determines whether or not an NFT is blue chip or not just comes down to the market cap um, of those of those uh, collections. So we're just looking at the six biggest collections by market cap and trading volume. Mm, okay. Um, so it's a pretty it's a pretty straightforward uh, definition. We we tried to add collections that. Uh, when we were designing the inclusion criteria that had above like a fifty million dollar market cap, which is small in altcoin terms, but is very big in NFT terms, unfortunately, mm. at least for now. Yeah. Um. So, and it T equals zero. We have a great fill. Now there's now there's a bunch of NFTs in the index. There's a bunch of people who own uh, this NFT token. Uh, there's a Uniswap uh, V3 pool. It um, it has uh, concentrated liquidity. People are uh, moving their concentrated liquidity um, based on the calculated peg price. So calculated peg price is essentially just um, the price of each Chainlink Oracle uh, for each collection inside, and then you just add it up, right? So... Let's back up a little bit. Uh, the great fill, uh, they're, they're filling in NFTs into the index, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then in, in return, they get an issuance of these NFT tokens once the, the, the exactly. first initial phase of these index uh, of the great fill is done. And then the, I'm assuming the NFT tokens would have uh, Ethereum on the side to pair it with uh, on Uniswap V3 in the concentrated liquidity code, right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Got it. And what does the ETH come from? From the NFTs that are that are pairing with? Well, the the ETH just comes from whoever wants to be an LP, and there will be uh, token incentives uh, for people who initially provide liquidity on on the uh, Uniswap pool. Got it. So, and then at that point, they they can essentially know where they should be concentrating their liquidity based on the calculated peg price. Which they can act, which is calculated and accessible on chain, and all of that, mm. right? And it's just based on the chain link prices. And and, and the peg price would, would be like the total sum of the NFT held in the index uh, divided by number of NFT tokens. This, this is where it gets gets funny because you, you guys, the index token is called NFTs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a very ambitious branding move. You know, hopefully, hopefully that worked out long term. Uh, I'm having trouble explaining myself because the name of it is NFTs. I, I, I think just use 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 the word index token. Index to token. Okay, to okay, the, okay. Yeah, just yeah. yeah. So the calculated peg price is like the total value of the index uh, multiplied by chaining price speed. Uh, that that gives you the treasury, if you will. Uh, index value and then the total number of index tokens in supply uh, divided by the sorry uh, the index value divided by the index token supply index. would be the peg price yeah. of the of a token right yeah okay all right that's exactly cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right so now you got the system set up uh, you have liquidity. People can buy from the Uni V3 pool if they want to. Uh, people, if they if they have the token and they see that, like for example, like the peg price deviated, like people bought a bunch, the liquidity is um, kind of evaporated. You know, um, evaporated uh, close to the peg. They they see like an arbitrage opportunity. They can go. They can redeem the index token. Um, with Fungify, and they can get the underlying NFTs, um, and and it can go the other way as well, um, where they can go and they can redeem NFTs and get the index token and sell it into the pool and get ETH if they see that uh, the peg has deviated, mm. right? So there's there's essentially like two way arbitrage, uh, full backing of the peg um, and of the NFT asset. And then, so, okay, that, that kind of covers um, sellers, um, kind of covers um, bootstrapping the initial system. And then, uh, like, say you're a borrower or something like that. You, you have um, an NFT that, you know, you really like, you think is valuable to you. Um, you don't 
you know, you, you want to get liquidity though. So you come to our system, you put it up as collateral, you get a uh, NFT uh, index token, right? And you're able to go and do whatever you want. You could sell that. You can borrow against it um, on another protocol, get USDC, get more ETH, uh, whatever you would like in that case. Um, if you, it, if your collateral value uh, drops heavily against the index, then that does cause it to um, be uh, subsumed by the index. So it'll slide over into the index where people are actually able to redeem it uh, using the back tokens. Mm. Um, right. Um, and, you know, that's, I mean, every every lending protocol basically has a liquidate, has some liquidation mechanism of some sort. The real question is just, you know, how much market volatility triggers that? And um, you, you, need, you need more for Fungify just because you're borrowing against the index rather than either USDC. Mm. So, okay, that's the borrower, that's the sellers, that's uh, okay. a couple of questions here. Providers, so I think that's, uh, oh yeah, yeah go ahead. Just, just kind of unpack a little bit. Um, when you say sellers, what do they do? They come to the protocol and they say, all right, I have this Azuki and it's part of the index so I can sell into it. Um, give us a, an example. Let's say there's, um, one, uh, th there's one, just for, for the simplicity of, of this example, let's say there's one NFT, uh, per collection in this index right now. And there's like what, six, seven different, uh, collections in this index. Um, if I have mm -hmm. to sell into as a seller, if I have an Azuki, I want to sell into the index. So changing the number of units from one to two in the index, that would assume that would change sort of the, the weight of, of the index a little bit, right? Um, what does the process look like? Is there like a fee for selling into uh, the index? Um, does the fee change based on the index uh, distribution of uh, different collections that are held in the index right now? Um, and yeah, uh, do you have any, any uh, things you can explain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the way it works is we, we there's penalties and there's reward based on how your sale is going to impact the overall balance of the index, mm. right? So like in the, in the case, in your case of Azuki's, you've, you've kind of unbalanced the index a little bit, right? But the key is, is it's actually only a little bit. So you, you have, you have the... You have the flex to sell that Azuki into the index without incurring any penalties, right? In that particular case, because you've only you've only moved it by one off. If it's one off, then there's no penalties. That's fine. It's if you try to push it more than one off, right? If you came in with a second Azuki, now there's increasing levels of penalties to the sale price that you'll get. The sale price. Um, being determined by uh, the Chainlink uh, floor price uh, mm. oracle, right? So, you know, it, and that allows you, like, you know, you could go, you could put a Azuki. Let's say you had one of each in the collection, right? Yeah. You, so you sell one Azuki to it, then you're like, oh, I'll sell like an ape, I'll sell a punk, I'll sell a doodle, etc. You're able to increase everything to two in the index. And that's also, and you, you don't incur any penalties mm, doing that. Okay. So yeah, we, 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 we based it on how many off you are, um, to kind of avoid like weird fractional calculations and like, there be like weird penalties cropping up in kind of corner cases where, <clears throat> where it's like not even possible to, you know, quote unquote balance the index. So mm. we, 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 we gave it like this flex of like off by one. And that's fine before penalties yeah. start accruing. It kind of reminds me of uh, of GMX a little bit, like the spot swapping. Because GMX has like an ideal ratio across the assets they have in GLP. And if you're balancing by swapping in uh, into the pool, uh, you get a discount. If you're if you're uh, selling into the pool or buying from it and you know, creates a balance, you get incur uh, a higher fee. Uh, based on those yeah and and we actually definitely see some analogies uh between gmx and and the and the index 
Uh, so we, we, we have the bonuses. We have the penalties. I think, like, the big difference between, like, sort of, like, what, like the GMX index approach versus the Fungify index approach. Um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're facilitate, facilitating totally different use cases. One of them's for lending. One of them's for perps. Um, but the big difference is, like, you're not really, like, counterparty to the the people you're not really counterparty to like any kind of trades like your your payoff is is um you know essentially tracking the volatility of the underlying assets and you don't have any like counterparties that you kind of have to like hedge against mm. if that makes sense yeah that makes sense that covers it for sellers um <laughs> So for for borrowers, um, what type of what type of LTVs are we looking at uh, for borrowers? Let's say um, my Azuki is worth. I don't know. I'm just kind of making it making it out of thin air right now. Let's say it's worth three thousand NFT t- uh, in index tokens. Um, how much can I borrow from the from the protocol? Um, and at what point? What should I be aware of as a borrower? in terms of uh, liquidation, uh, maintenance margin ratio. Uh, yeah, what does that look like? Yeah, sure, um, I'll, I'll get this one. Um, so I, we can offer really high or, or fairly high LTVs just because uh, the risk here to the protocol is very different. The risk profile looks very different uh, because you are borrowing against the index. Um, so we can offer, prob- you know, we're starting off at 75%, but I think we can comfortably increase that up to 80 to 85%. Mm. Uh, and uh, the other benefit is that, you know, uh, right now on testnet, this isn't enabled, but in, in shortly we'll, we'll enable uh, the ability to borrow using multiple NFTs in a single loan. So let's say you come in as, uh, let's say the, the index contains six different collections, right? Yeah, uh, if you were to come and borrow using six of those NFTs, you basically have a loan that's not liquidatable at that point, unless obviously your interest that's accrued surpasses, you know, the the amount, uh, 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 sur- uh, you know, surpasses the, the, the that amount to the past where, where we need to liquidate. But um, so I think there's like some really interesting ways we can structure these loans that other protocols can't do. Um, so... Break that down for mm-hmm. us. Like, why does that make it a non-liquidatable loan if you were to provide liquidity for if you were to put sure. up collateral? For, yeah. So, yeah. so let's. Yeah. So, so the idea of borrowing against the index, if if you sort of break that down, right? Um, uh, the the index moves in price according to the underlying assets or underlying co- you know collection of. Uh, or NFT collections, right? The weighted collection. Mm. And uh, let's say you come in and you use an Azuki, right? In order for that Azuki to get liquidated, it has to fall against that index price, right? Mm. But you have to keep in mind that the Azuki makes up part of the index. So the price movement is sort of correlated, right? Mm. The Azuki would have to move you know, uh, would have to move against the overall index price for it to be liquidated. So unlike, let's say you go to another lending protocol where you're borrowing ETH, in that case, it's just purely the price of Azuki versus ETH, right? Mm. So if ETH goes up or Azuki goes down, then you're at a high risk. Mm. Um, So now imagine that, you know, you had Azuki plus, let's say the other five NFTs that are contained within the collection and you package that into one or uh, one collateral, right? Mm. Uh, or, or collateral for a loan. Now those six NFTs perfectly track the index price or the composition, right? Mm. And so there's no way for it to fall uh, below, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, LTV point, um, unless you know, obviously, it, it the loan sits there for long enough and enough interest accrues. So uh, that that's where we mean it becomes almost like a non-liquidatable loan. Mm. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, just doing a quick math here, um, for those that are listening, if you want to take out a loan with, well, currently you guys have six different collections, uh, on, on the platform, um, you would need, uh, hang on one second, roughly 125 ETH, 
worth of NFTs to take out a loan. And that gives you an NFT index token backing of uh, 0.75, so roughly a um, hundred and uh, about 93 ETH uh, worth of liquidity mm-hmm. um, in, in, in the form of index tokens. That's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So does that make it a whale game or can you pair people up? To, to... No, no. So wait, to be clear, you can take out a loan against a single NFT. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, yeah I'm just, I'm just... Azuki Doodle, or oh, but but you mean like as if you wanted to take out this sort of non-liquidatable loan? Is that is that what you mean? Or yeah, or... let's say let's say if you put up a guild, okay, and the guild name is like non-liquidatable <laughs> guild, you pair up people that put up money together yeah. and like put different entities together and just like enter a non-liquidatable loan against the protocol. <laughs> That's actually that's actually that, a really fun is, idea. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's actually fact. that's actually pretty cool. I mean, this may, there may be some composability there, building you know people building on top of us. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, no, actually, we didn't. We haven't really uh, thought about that. Uh, um, but that that's a really uh, that is a very interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of just spitballing here. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So okay. As a borrower, so the, the 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 number you're really looking for is really if you're borrowing against uh, the 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 index with a single asset, mm-hmm. what you really should be looking out for is the delta in between your asset versus others in the index, right? Correct. Uh, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then let's we cover sellers, we covered uh, the the borrowers, um, and who else? What, what what other actors are in the? I, in the I, yeah, I, I think um, just the index token holder, right? I think that's the one that we haven't really talked about, which is, um, you know, this this addresses uh, part of sort of the question of, you, you know, the barrier to entry mm. for a lot of people in the NFT market. Mm. Um, that barrier to entry is quite high if you want exposure to any of these blue chip connections. Even, the, I think, what, like the cheapest, what we call the blue chip you know, I, I, if we're going to say Miladies now, or actually Penguins or Zuki, or uh, there's some collections even cheaper than Miladies now, but um, they're, uh, you know, you're looking at like five to ten thousand dollars, right, mm, minimum, mm. and that that's pretty high. Um, so our goal here with the index is your ability to uh, come in at any scale. So whether you're like a retail user looking to purchase for a few hundred, mm. or maybe you're even thinking uh, longer and, 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 and sort of uh, at, a, at a bigger picture level, maybe there's like institutional investors that are really interested in the index. Mm. And that's actually a question that we received while we were around pitching, which was, you know, some of these firms or VCs, um, they're like, hey, we're not interested in going and composing uh, an index of NFTs ourselves. Like, it would be amazing just to have like an index that we could hold. Yeah. And so catering to that use case, but but beyond that, like it's it's strictly better than in the other index because you're earning yield on top. Mm-hmm. Um, so how uh, how, how are you I mean, earning yield on top for for holding a token? Yeah, and so any uh, so because the index can be lent out, the interest that's being paid by the borrowers is uh, you know then distributed to uh, the index token holders. Um, mm. And then also any sort of redemption sales, et cetera, that occur within the protocol, um, the fee that's taken is then redistributed to uh, index token holders as well. Okay. So it's it's sort of, yeah. It, it, yeah. Yeah. So, so as a There's, borrower, you're borrowing index tokens and to pay back your loan and the interest for borrowing the, the index tokens, you need to pay back in, in index tokens, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Yeah. So, as a protocol, uh, you're you're generating your your sort of your your income, if you will, directly from the index tokens, and therefore for the token holders, they're generating yield. So, do they need staking? Is there a staking for them to stake? For, you know, to earn? there there is staking, but it's it's uh, uh the, the derivative token is tradable, so it's not you're not locked in. Mm. So. Mm. Um, uh, we we actually think that most of the trading will happen in the derivative token. Uh, in the, in the of, index of the stake itself. index. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so if I'm holding the index tokens, how does the yield get to me? Do they get airdropped or do I need to stake it? Oh, um, 
Okay, so when you stake the index token, right, um, it, it's sort of similar to how Sushi uh, uh, sort of uh, distributes Sushi token. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or not Sushi token. Uh, it, yeah, it's a similar concept yeah, um, the sushi to that. Bar. It's just your, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and here's another question, right? Like, uh, I, I've seen index... Uh, Index funds for NFTs, and this has been down only, which is pretty pretty sad. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a company called oh, I'm trying to find the name of it. What is it. What's it called? Bit something. Is it Bitscale? Bitwise. Yeah. Bitwise. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. So they have they have a centralized index fund. I believe they're offering it as like an ETF on like the trad American markets. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's been kind of the approach to the indexes mm -hmm. so far. Um, it's just some centralized party putting them together and then you kind of pay them fees to, to manage it and rebalance it yeah. and all of that. And this, you know, kind of turns it on its head where there's no centralized party and you're getting paid fees. Um, and, you know, and it's being uh, balanced and managed automatically. Yeah, which is quite interesting. So, um, allow me to get my, have my in imagination run wild a little bit. Um, how does one short the index if they want to short it? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you can, so, um, you know, there, there's going to be people, uh, we, we, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll just spill it. There's going to, there's going to be a, a, a sort of a companion lending protocol, um, that we enable that, um, allows, you know, that takes the NFT token as collateral, um, that can, it, that it'll let it be a lending asset. Um, we hope that in time, uh, other lending protocols will also add the NFT token. So, I mean, on that, on that kind of, uh, you know, secondary level, you can just go and borrow it, borrow it just like any other asset, and then and then sell it, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of in terms of primarily, um, you know, within the system itself, it's going to be a little bit tricky because um, to to borrow to to kind of you if you borrow against your NFT and then sell the NFT token, you're kind of you're you're short, but you're short like relative to your collateral. So it's not really like um, what I would call a perfect short. So if, if you want a, a like a perfect short, you should just go and borrow it on the second layer lending protocol um, and sell it and just take the position that way. Yeah, so you could probably the the the, the dive guys D Y D E uh, they have this pretty interesting model where you allow people to supply NFTs as lender. With the assumption that you may not get back the same NFTs uh, that you you lent out, the borrowers come in, they just borrow the NFT, uh, putting up a collateral in and uh, I don't know in, in ETH whatever it is, and they they sell that on the open market, and with the assumption of like if the price goes down, they can take the capital that they have they have borrowed, uh, they have they, they have sold to buy back the any NFT in that collection. And then return the NFT to the lender. Uh, so uh, you guys probably use something similar as well, where people can borrow uh, the index token itself using some, some sort of collateral, and then sell it on the open market in, in, with the hope that if the price goes down, as an index in general, they can kind of capture the difference uh, and pay yeah. back to the to the lender. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly yeah, yeah. how it works. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, okay, thank you for uh, indulging my <laughs> imaginations. Uh, so we've covered uh, we've covered the sellers, the borrowers, the index token holders, uh, how they earn yield. What else is there in the in the well, five protocol? This is sort of uh, not a direct user, but but sort of uh, players that play within the market it, it is arbitragers who. Um, sort of look at the system and see if there's anything that they can extract right through arbitration. Which so there's, uh, I, I think uh, Mob touched on it a, a little bit. But anytime the the peg 
uh, has deviated right in the open market mm -hmm. um, you know for them to come in and sell an nft to the index to then capitalize on the, the open market peg or, or you know, arbitrage opportunity or vice versa if the peg is trading or the index token is trading below the peg you know they would um, buy it in the open market uh, and then come and redeem it for NFTs within the vault. So, so the key thing is like, you know, the index token is fully backed by NFTs. Mm. Uh, and, and there's no, I think we're seeing this problem a little bit in, for example, uh, floor, um, and some other places where their treasuries are, 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 are worth more than, uh, the, the token that's being traded in open market. Um, so in the case of an index token, right, the, the market is able to uh, bring, you know, the price of, of the token to parity to, to the central line. Mm. Uh, and and it, this is all like an open permissionless way. Uh, and, and I think that's that's the other player that I would uh, add as a sort of distinct. Yeah, I would say uh, there's a listener right now. Uh, the handle is Bursting Bagel. He probably has a, a few opinions and I... And, and his thoughts on floor and versus, uh, you know, this is sort of an index treasury uh, versus uh, versus fungi. So, um, if you have any questions or uh, any things you want today, feel free to raise your hand and chime in a little bit. Um, okay, so we've covered uh, the arbitrage as well. Uh, anything else? Anyone else uh, that are interacting with the protocol? uh no i think i think we got it uh um, yeah that's that's essentially uh all of the core protocol there is i mean i i i sort of mentioned it and it's it's a bit of alpha there's you know there is this sort of companion lending protocol that we sort of been talking about that's going to enable you to get uh you know lending liquidity for your nft token that's kind of like the core use case of it um because, you know, maybe maybe you don't want to sell the NFT token. Maybe you want to borrow against it. Maybe you want USDC. Maybe you want ETH. Maybe you want to uh, go around and leverage up or something like that. Mm. Or um, you want to short outright. Yeah. Um, or you yeah. want to short outright. And then that, be that becomes like another source of uh, yield for people holding the NFT token. So not only are you getting um, sort of uh, the internal sort of yield from uh, borrowers of the index, but then when you go to other lending protocols, you can kind of get additional yield on top of that from people who want to, from people who are probably mostly interested in shorting the index. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. I'm very, very excited. Um, and thank you for teasing me on which, <laughs> not telling us which lending and borrowing protocols you guys are companion you guys are working with. Um, there is one thing. Uh, what is a collector? Uh, I saw the in docs. Um, how does a collector interact with fungify oh I, I guess we did miss <laughs> we did miss uh one user um but yeah thank you for reminding us um so one of the one of the things we enable within our protocol is uh the ability to sell your nft uh while borrowing against it so you, you can think of this as like a cash advance on 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 your nft um so imagine let's say you have like a uh, a gold ape or or a hoodie punk, right? And you're looking to sell it, but there's not a lot of buyers. There's 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 not a lot of people that can sort of on the spot purchase it for that price. Um, what you can do under protocols come in, uh, you know, use it as collateral. So take out uh, some, you know, uh, equity or liquidity liquidity from that, and then have the ability to uh, put it up for sale at the same time. Mm. Um, so that way, there's enough time to sell your NFT while you know, you unlock some of the liquidity from within it. Mm. Um, so with that use case, it means that we have a built-in marketplace. Um, so all of the NFTs that are being used as collateral within our system can be put up for sale at the same time uh, with a price that's set to, at minimum, uh, the price of the loan. Um, so uh, everything is sort of handled for you if someone comes and purchase it it'll automatically close out your loan and yeah. and you walk away with the profit and to, to purchase uh, and you then, just have to yeah. use the index tokens to to redeem it right exactly yeah yeah exactly okay yeah and then um and then additionally you know um uh, i was mentioning this as the role of the arbitrager but it could be as a collector you know uh, we think we can really gamify the redemption mechanic where uh, so as of right now um when you redeem from the vault 
um, you actually, it, it's, it's, it's uh, randomized. So you get a random NFT from within the vault. And, um, you know, a, a collector can come in and, and play the odds and uh, maybe or, or hopefully redeem something of value uh, from within the vault. And you, you can you can even kind of imagine like uh, people building uh, on top of this, and because you know people love exposure to variance, it's the essence of the thrill of gambling. So you know, you can imagine people um, coming together, pooling their assets together, um, you know, and then activating the random uh, the random mechanism, and you know, one of them getting it and kind of being able to uh, you know in, enjoy you know <laughs> enjoy get entertainment from the exposure to that variance. There's there's kind of like uh, some platforms right now that are doing that. Yeah, was it Rollbit they, that had something like no, that as well? It, it or was like, it, it came like Meta something. It was, it was honestly kind of, <laughs> I've seen one platform do it. They're like kind of centralized and maybe it gave me weird vibes, but the concept <laughs> is there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Okay. No, thanks for thanks for covering that. And like a, one more question, right? Since you know, the, the, there is this randomness aspect of it, uh, one thing we haven't touched on is, is Fungify applicable to mid-tier and rare NFTs or, or is, it, is it mostly servicing the near four NFTs? For most collections, it's all just floor, but we do have this concept of floor multiplier. Mm. So for uh, rarity types that are very clearly defined in terms of market value, um, like Cody Punks, let's say, you know, we, we enable like a two X multiplier. Um, this that's, that's so, so it does cater to that in that way. Got it. Yeah. yeah. I, I do think like generally we're going to, as a community, try to be more conservative on the multipliers and stick to ones that where there's like a very solid social consensus around them, which I think, I think is actually kind of rare um, right now. Um, you know, even like aside from maybe like the punks and apes, you know, multipliers that pretty much everyone agrees on are in the other collections are like probably not that common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, we've covered a bunch. Um, and thank you for answering all the questions. Um, Fungify, what is the current status? What does the next three to six months look like? What should people be paying attention to? Yeah. Um, so right now we're uh, we're ramping things up for testnet. Um, uh, we've I think we've had over a thousand people register so far. Uh, we've done sort of small batches of entries. We're going to open that up to the public pretty soon. Um, and uh, after that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I think you guys are just wrapping up your trading competition. There's actually going to be a trading competition from uh, Fungify as well. Um, Sponsored by NFT. <laughs> yes, exactly. The illustrious <laughs> and, perks and Spice Finance, and uh, we, have, yeah. we have potentially some other people we might announce. Um, so I, I think it's going to be it, it is a paper trading competition. Uh, some big prizes uh, and incentives in place, um, and uh, you know we're going to be pretty excited about that. I, I think hopefully we can also unveil the second part of Fungify. The, the master plan will unfold. Uh, it's been in the works for some time, but uh, I promise it's worth it. Um, so that, that's what it's looking like for the next month or so. And then after this paper trading competition, uh, it'll be the launch of the protocol itself. Exciting. Uh, I very much look forward to it. Um, it's been in the works for quite some time and really, uh, really excited for you guys. Um, and, you know, look forward to a bunch of different collaborations uh and initiatives that we can uh we can help on yeah for sure um yeah thank you I... so much for having us it's been such a great space yeah no appreciate you guys uh breaking down the details of the protocol it's Fungify is one of the most exciting NFT finance protocols and innovative ones um that i've talked to talked to uh, there's a lot of different lending environment protocols out there, and you get into that niche, you get you get sort of very very focused on problem solving, and it gets very very granular. Um, it's nice to see a different take on NFT lending environment and, and, and index and solving different problems in the NFT finance space. So, 
Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, any questions from the listeners? If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, right now is the time. If not, we're going to let these guys go. Um, yeah, thank you guys for, for coming on. All right. All right. Thanks, sir. This is great. Have a good weekend. Bye. All right. Take it easy, guys. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Welcome at JPEG Podcast. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your audio podcast from, give us a like, a subscribe if you like the content, and we'll see you in the next episode.